welcome everyone um, for joining us at our um, inaugural, I guess, learning series um, titled Dismantling Racism with Data. We're so happy that you're joining us during your lunch hour. Today's conversation is gonna be focused on best practices for data analysis and data visualization in your advocacy work. Um, a reminder that this is part one of this learning series. In part two, Pam Anglin from Forward Movement Consulting will be taking will be talking to us about best practices for communicating about data as you use it in your different advocacy um, projects. So throughout our conversation, please feel free to share any questions that you have in the chat box, and I'll try my best to answer them. A little bit about myself. My name is Vicki Kraus, and I'm a policy analyst and the North Carolina Kids Count Project Director here at NC Child. So that means that I get to lead our data work and make sure that advocates and decision makers have access to accurate data um, and up-to-date data on kids in North Carolina. So if you will ever have a question um, or in need of data technical assistance, please feel free to send me an email and I'm happy to help you find what you're looking for. And I'll include my contact information on the last slide. So um, going to the About NC Child slide next. NC Child is the state's only nonpartisan multi-issue policy advocacy organization for children. And we work to build a strong North Carolina by advancing public policies to ensure that all children, regardless of race, ethnicity, or place of birth, have the opportunity to achieve their full potential. We believe that public investments, evidence-based policy, and systems change are essential levers for improving the lives of children. And we do this work by focusing on four main areas, high quality early education, healthy children, nurturing homes and communities, and family economic security. And though we have these distinct four areas, we understand that children's issues are interdependent. So that's a little bit about our approach. So let's go to the next slide. So to kick us off, I want to hear from you all. In the chat, can you all share how your agency currently uses data? So whether you're putting some data on children in your community in your annual report, or perhaps you're already using data in public facing materials, perhaps on your social media accounts, how are you using data um, already? And this kind of helps us all get an idea of where we're coming from, where we're at with data work. So I'll allow just a couple of minutes for you all to um, sound off in the chat. Great. So I'm seeing quarterly and annual reports, using data to inform decision making, policy and program development, program evaluation, very important monitoring trends and informing decision-making, grant reports, wonderful. So I'm seeing a lot of internal, uh, internal use of data, right? For our grant reports, tracking for our own planning and program design purposes, um, I see some external data use, so sharing with stakeholders, Board of Education, partners, et cetera. That's great, from Cape Fear Collective, building a publicly accessible community data platform. That's really, that's really great. Awesome, well, thank you all so much for sharing and feel free to keep um, putting in your um, answer in there. And, um, and this is just really helpful to see kind of where we all are. On, um, on data advocacy. So let's go to the next slide. One thing we know about data is that reliable data is the backbone of any effective advocacy work because it helps us not only define the scope of a problem, but also any potential solutions. So where you look for data to get started in advocacy work will really depend a lot on the question you're attempting to answer with that data. But a good place to start is the Kids Count Data Center. So let's go to the next slide. The Kids Count Data Center is the only place for comprehensive data related to children and families all in one place. 
Pitts Count is a nonpartisan um, agency and they provide objective data with sources and appropriate context that is easily accessible and helps you make meaningful data-driven decisions. So you can access the Kids Count Center through NC Child's website at ncchild.org or through the link on this slide to further explore some of that data that I'll be talking about today. Um, and so you can find data that's disaggregated or um, stratified by race and ethnicity. You can also find data at the county level. So if you wanna know how kids are doing in your specific county, that's a really great place to look. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Oh, this is like a Spanish slide. <laughs> Um, that's fine. We'll, I'll read it in English. Um, so one of the things that we know about um, population data uh, on the thread of where to find data, we know that large population data can mask some variation in child well-being. Children's well-being depends on the well-being of their families and communities, including the county, city, and neighborhood in which a child is born and raised. So access to access and outcomes for children in smaller and more rural counties can be very different than those experienced by children born in larger, more metropolitan counties. So even within more well-equipped counties, there often exist broad disparities among children of different income levels and ethnicities. And that's one of the things that we really want to pay attention to. So one of the ways that we may want to look at the data on children is at the county level. So let's go to the next slide. NC Child's um, county data cards are a good place to start when looking at county data. Uh, these data cards provide a data snapshot of kids across 15 key indicators of children's health and well being across our four focus areas. From early start in life to health and wellness, you can find different data points for that are up to date. And they also include basic demographic data on children for each county. So this year was the first year that we actually released these county data cards in an interactive format with data available by race and ethnicity. So I encourage you all to explore that new data dashboard on our website. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll jump into um, talking about the different recommendations, dif different best practices for data analysis and visualization. So now that you know some of the places to find data, um, on children in North Carolina, let's jump into um, tip number one. Disaggregated data is the foundation for equity. Professor Krakow of Stanford says it puts it like this, raw data is like the iron ore, it needs to be formed into a tool. So we know that data needs to be presented in ways that can make it clear to people what's wrong and what they can do about it in order for it to become action rather than just information. So when it comes to advocacy, our job is to turn data from just information, just a raw statistic to um, something that can activate someone to take action. So the first step in doing that is to present an accurate picture of what's happening. And we can't do that without showing whatever disaggregated or stratified data is available to represent the full picture of what's going on in our communities. So rather than expecting data to only tell you what is happening, we want to dig deeper until we find, um, until we're able to point to some of the reasons about why it happens, right? So that is um, the way that we're connecting the dot in advocacy. We have a raw statistic, we want to be able to dig down to the root cause, uh, perhaps influencing that statistic, you know, children experiencing poverty, for example, and be able to tell folks about the why. And that's what can make it really meaningful and easy to remember for people. So let's go to the next slide. A good example is child poverty. So across the state, we know that nearly half of children in the state or 45% live in poor or low income homes. That's families living at 200% um, or below the federal poverty level. And, um, and while we know that that in itself is unacceptable, the data tells us a much more policy focused story when disaggregated by race. So um, if you wanna click next, we will, there we go. Um, and you can keep going um, until we get the breakdown by all the groups. So you can see here when we look at the data disaggregated by race and ethnicity, um, we can see that there's a pattern to poverty in our state for kids. That's giving us disproportionately negative outcomes for black and Latino children. 
So almost 70% of Hispanic or Latino children and 60% of Black children are experiencing poverty compared to about a third and 30%, uh, well, a third of API children and 30% of white children. So let's dig a little bit deeper, right? Because we also don't want to just pre uh, present these raw statistics, um, particularly because they are desired by race and ethnicity. Um, and that will be um, the next recommendation. Um, so let's go on to the next one. So tip number two is consider how outcomes may be linked. All right, we can go on to the next slide. So we know that one data point can lead us to consider another, uh, which may have bigger implications for policy and practice change. So continuing with poverty, um, with the example about children experiencing poverty from before, we can consider now some data on parental employment. So we can see from the graph here that Black and Hispanic parents are more likely than API and white parents to lack full-time year-round employment. So we're seeing that breakdown by race and we can already see some differences across racial groups. So there's something that might start spinning in our head, right, about if we were had just been looking at child poverty levels across race, we might go ahead and fill in the blank and think about the individual factors. But this data kind of helps us to start seeing what some of the structural barriers might be. So let's go to the next slide. So now we're looking at median household income. Now we can see a fuller picture of family circumstances that points us toward the information we need to be seeking out and sharing about the why. So can you, continuing to use our example, Black and Latino parents are less likely to be working full-time high-wage jobs in North Carolina and subsequently why their children are more likely to be living in poor and low-income homes. So we can see here now how these three outcomes really might be linked. There's something structural there, some kind of barrier that um, prevents or set of barriers that can prevent um, you know, people of color, uh, parents of color to have access to high wage jobs and full-time year round employment. And that can lead to higher levels of child poverty for black and Latino kids. So we're digging down there to the root causes, thinking about some of the structural barriers and root causes, and that can help us start to form our argument to advocate for action. So let's go to the next slide. So tip number three is to don't let data stand alone. So there are two reasons for this. The first is that data is most effective at driving change when it can speak both to the head and the heart. Secondly, data without context can take on any meaning someone might ascribe. So that's what I was saying earlier about child poverty, right? If we just have the raw statistic there and we don't contextualize it or help folks see how different outcomes may be linked, um, we leave it there open for interpretation and we don't wanna do that. All right, so next slide, at least not when it comes to advocacy. So Paul Slavik, who is a cognitive psychologist at the University of Oregon says, says it like this, numerical representations of human lives do not necessarily convey the importance of those lives. All too often, the numbers represent dry statistics, human beings with the tears dried off. So this slide is really an example of our point. Quotes and personal stories can really draw people in and are often what's remembered even if the data is not. So your strength as advocates really lies in your lived experience of having been youth at some point or children in need of a voice or having worked with them or currently working with them. And that's, those are some of the things that you can draw from. So that is something that data alone cannot convey. All right, we can move on to the next slide. Using pictures, call out quotes, and information boxes and personal experience boxes in the way you present your data helps people understand important points, but also the human values called forth in your advocacy. And that's what's really important, right? These are all the ways um, to clarify additional points and also make it plain that your data work is more than just work about data. It's work about people. And ultimately, data is a tool. If you use it well, 
it helps you tell stories, which change the minds and hearts behind policy. And that's how we can change outcome for kids. So let's go on to the next slide. Elaine Mejia from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities shared some really great advice on the topic of not letting data stand alone. She says, don't put out bare facts about race that you're packaging within values or goals or vision. A bare statistic about a racial ethnic group can inadvertently reinforce negative biases that the audience may hold about that group. In essence, you are letting them fill in the blank. So instead of saying 40% of Latinx kids are poor, it can start with opportunity is still out of reach for so many families, 40% of Latino kids are experiencing poverty, right? So we start with um, setting our, contextualizing the data within a structure, you know, a conversation about structural barriers um, rather than just, you know, going ahead and zooming in on what's happening with this particular racial ethnic group. So in your tables, graphs, different forms of data visualization, take a look at how you're contextualizing the data. Um, also, don't only talk about race and people of color when you're talking about the problem. That inadvertently can have the effect of making communities of color seem like the problem. So we also want to, when talking about race, let's um, join that with a conversation about our vision and our goals and about what's possible for communities, right? So positive framing. And um, I know Pam will get into that a little bit more in her presentation in part two. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. So similarly, it's important to consider how our data visualization, um, so graphs, infographics, um, reflects our values and our goals so that we're not reinforcing otherizing language or accidentally reinforcing racial stereotypes. So for example, things that imply collective group-wide weakness that don't actually reveal the structural reasons about the why, blanket terms like vulnerable or disadvantaged. Let's think about and map out these terms and think about how we're using them and try to move beyond them or at least when we're talking about them, um, always pairing them with the structural reasons, the why. Um, and I pulled these tweets to share as examples because I think they're really great examples of how we can contextualize data that we use and how we can do that while highlighting our values. So one of our partner agencies, um, the Georgia Budget Policy Institute, has a Medicaid expansion campaign similar to North Carolina. And they share a tweet about health equity, right? and pointing um, who are the folks who are left in the coverage gap. So 57% of people of color, of Georgians, are those who still don't have access to healthcare coverage. And right under near, underneath, underneath that, in a really pithy and a brief way, they have a tagline, health justice equals racial justice. They're, so they're pointing that back to their values, right? This is where they stand and how they view this issue. And so that's just one way that you can contextualize a data point. And on the right, um, we can see here the data point was 60% of North Carolina children have moved to distance learning. So our tweet is about how we, how so many kids are um, in need of broadband internet because of the fact that they're using distance learning now. And, um, and I like the sentence, broadband internet isn't available to every family. So again, we're contextualizing it with the structural issue at play and then highlighting our data point. And we quickly in those two sentences, um, you know, in the length of a tweet, we can talk about the why and also share an opportunity for folks to learn more. So maybe we're pointing them to a resource or an action, uh, action alert. So some way that they can take action on, on the why. And you can also see um, in these two examples, just good ways of um, making your data look attractive, stand out with an image, um, big font, et cetera. So those are some of the ways that you can use data in your advocacy. So let's go on to the next slide. So um, let's do a quick recommendations recap. Disaggregated data is a foundation for equity. It helps us present an accurate picture of what's going on in our communities. Tip number two was consider how outcomes may be linked. Doing so helps us move from explaining the what about the problem and instead telling the why about a problem to move people to action. 
And then tip number three was don't let data stand alone. Data is most effective at driving change when it can speak to both the head and the heart. All right, we can move on to the next slide. So I want to open it up before we um, have our last chat prompt for you all. I want to open it up to any conversations that folks may have at this point. Um, and Fawn, if you want to help me um, field any questions that you saw, I'll be happy to answer them. Or if someone else knows the answer, please feel free to jump in. So Vicki, the only question I see coming up in the chat is just about access to the slides. So I'll just let folks know that after this meeting is over, we will send out recordings and slides in Spanish and English. Great. All right, well, I'm, I'm surprised there are no questions, um, but let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So in the chat, um, I want you all to share a takeaway from today's conversation. So what's something that you learned um, that you didn't know before, or you can share some way that you'd like to integrate data into your work in a way that perhaps you weren't doing before, now that you have some of the information from today's conversation. So I'll go ahead and um, look at the chat and just do that for about 30 seconds to a minute. Great, so I'm seeing some really great um, reflections here. Um, lots of folks talking about the importance of contextualizing their data. The, the point that data is about the people, not the numbers, right? That's really important to keep in mind and can really help us as we think about the way that we message about data as well and what data we want to use, you know? and focusing on the why, not the what. That can really bring our data to life. And I like the leave a course of action, yes. Ending with a, with a form of action, opportunity to take action is so critical in advocacy. I see a question here. Can you share a little bit more about what you said about not just sharing about one race? It was right before you talked about thinking about terms we use. Um, yeah, so I think maybe I didn't finish this, a sentence, but I was um, simply talking about, you know, if we're talking about specific racial groups, um, we don't just want to leave our, you know, just share raw statistics, right? 40% of Latino children are experiencing poverty. We want to contextualize that data within the broader conversation of what structural issues are at play. Um, and because the reason why we have to do that is because if we just present raw statistics, we're leaving them open to interpretation by folks. So they can fill in the blank with their own biases about a racial group um, or, you know, just, just kind of be thinking on some different realm that, you know, isn't exactly where we're trying to have them focus on for the purpose of our advocacy or our campaign, right? So I think that's what I was, um, referring to. Yeah, that's a that's a really great point, Fawn. One tip that we picked up recently from our co colleague Myra Jones Taylor is that instead of calling kids or families vulnerable, talk about children or families who are furthest from opportunity. That's a really great way of reframing that that word that that we, you know, just use out of habit and just because that's the way we've talked about, you know, children furthest from opportunity for so long. Great, well, thank you all so much for sharing. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So remember that this was just part one of our learning series. Part two will be led by Pam Anglin from Forward Moving uh, Consulting. And, um, and this will be focused on best practices for communicating about data. So again, this will be during a lunch hour on Thursday, June 17th, so next month. 
And please don't forget that um, the deadline for applying for your agency to get um, some more detailed technical assistance about data work and data advocacy is open until May 28th. So if you you work with an agency that serves kids and you're really interested in getting some more detailed um, technical assistance about how you can integrate data into your work, into your advocacy work, please apply. It's a really easy application and, um, and we would love to connect with you. All right, so the last slide is just my contact information. Thank you. And, um, and so please feel free to explore our website and email me if you have any questions. And yes, we will have the webinar recording for the second um, webinar as well. Um, Fawn, will those just be on our YouTube page? Is that where folks can find them easily? Um, they will be on NC Child's YouTube page and we'll also um, send them out to um, everyone who registered for the meeting. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you all have a good rest of your day and a good rest of your week.